Ford has used advanced technology to create a new generation of high-efficiency double overhead cam engines for volume production. This new range has been designed to operate at best-in-class levels of efficiency and emission control to be responsive, refined, reliable, each unit produced to the most exacting standards. Eventually, the range will provide power in four car lines produced across two continents with an annual production capacity of over a million units. Ford's new family of 16-valve DOHC engines. The state-of-the-art cylinder head in this new engine incorporates 16-valve technology. The sequential fuel injection system is the very latest of its type, providing a precise fuel supply that means efficient and clean combustion. The EEC-4 microprocessor has a 56K memory and the power to monitor and to manage injection, ignition and emission control systems at optimum efficiency. A three-way catalytic converter is fitted as standard throughout the engine range. The all-new bottom end has been developed to minimize noise and vibration. By retaining previous conceptual architecture, it benefits from the toughness and reliability of proven technology. The key to bottom end stiffness is the structural oil pan. Bolted to the engine block and the transmission housing, the oil pan acts as a brace, reducing resonance and vibration. The cast iron block is compact and strong. Overall, this engine is robust and responsive. It starts in an instant and it's smooth. At tickover, drivers may just hear it, they certainly won't feel it. They will sense its willingness as it revs effortlessly up to 7,000 RPM, at which point a progressive rev limiter starts to act. That performance quality is provided by highly efficient and clean combustion. Air is drawn in through the inlet manifold towards the fuel injectors. These injectors, managed by the EEC-4 microprocessor, deliver a precise measure of atomized fuel at just the right moment. The injectors are side-fed and seated in a forged aluminium injector rail. This compact design traps very small volumes of fuel and is easily purged of fuel vapor. Fuel is injected sequentially in firing order to arrive at exactly the same moment in each induction cycle. Injection onto the hot valve vaporizes the fuel. The air-fuel mixture that arrives in the combustion chamber is completely homogeneous, which means thorough and clean combustion. Four valves in each cylinder increase the valve curtain area available for flow. That gives more capacity for deeper breathing, even with short valve events, which provides strong, low-speed torque and stable combustion. The angle and aerodynamics of the intake ports create a controlled tumbling motion. This is retained and accelerated during compression. Just before ignition, the tumble breaks into the microturbulence necessary for stable and clean combustion. 
The pent roof combustion chamber has been designed to minimize crevices, leaving all the mixture readily accessible to the ignition flame. From the spark plug's position at the center of the chamber, the flame front propagates rapidly through the turbulent mixture. The fast burn rate adds further to the outstanding stability and efficiency of combustion. Platinum-coated spark plug tips provide faultless ignition throughout extended service intervals. The key-operated ignition switch is the only moving part in the ignition system. Distributorless ignition has substituted moving parts with solid-state electronics. The EEC-4 microprocessor continuously monitors and controls every aspect of the engine's operation. EEC-4 has the capacity to adapt and learn so as to optimize control of the engine. For example, it monitors the heated exhaust gas oxygen sensor, called HEGO, located in the exhaust pipe, which feeds back data on combustion to EEC-4, so creating accurate closed-loop control of the air-fuel mixture. Also in the exhaust system, a pulse air system assists the conversion of residual carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons. But the efficiency of combustion means that there's a very low level of feed gas emissions passing through this comprehensive emission control process. Furthermore, engine design has been matched to optimize conditions for the three-way catalyst. This new engine range offers state-of-the-art technology as a real and affordable choice for everyone. And it's not just the operating features that encourage this view. In service two, longer intervals between visits to the workshop, a lower service content, the ease with which the units can be maintained, all contribute to the low cost of ownership. Minor inspections are recommended at 10,000 miles. They include an oil change and an oil filter change. Major service inspections are recommended every 30,000 miles, at which spark plugs are changed. This long plug life is due to the use of new materials which include platinum coating of both the side and central electrodes. At 60,000 miles, the timing belt has to be renewed. This low content at recommended service inspections is supported by the ease with which more major repair work can be carried out on the engines. And to assist in one particularly time-consuming area, work to the valve train, three new special tools have been introduced. There's an ingenious valve collet remover and replacer, which takes all the fiddle out of a time-consuming job. The valve stem seal seat assembly can be removed with another new tool. There's a new camshaft alignment tool to help position the camshafts precisely for replacement of the timing belt after any work to the valve train or perhaps after head removal. For diagnostic work on the fuel system, there's also a new adapter for your fuel pressure tester. So this exciting new engine range not only offers benefits to the owner, but also to those of you in service. In part two of this program, we'll look at the principal service actions you need to know. Engine dismantling, assembling, and a few other related but unfamiliar items. While against the backdrop of a historical review of Ford's EEC-4 system, Part 3 details the major contribution this sophisticated management system makes to the new range of 16-valve DOHC engines. Ford's new 16-valve DOHC engine range is being launched with two variants initially. Both are 1.8-litre units, with one producing 105 PS, the other 130 PS. The distinguishing features are that on the 130 unit, the throttle plate housing is marked with the number 55 and has a large throttle plate. The throttle plate housing on the 105 PS unit bears the number 42, has a smaller throttle plate and a different throttle linkage. 
These identifying features are worth remembering, because even side by side, the two engines do look very similar. Despite this, the new or unusual service and repair procedures we'll be covering in this part of the program, the new and existing special tools that should be used to help in this work, are the same for both the 105 and 130 PS units. Although a number of the procedures we'll cover can be carried out with the engine in the car, replacement of the timing belt, work on the valve train, head removal, replacement of engine oil seals, for ease of demonstration, we'll carry out these procedures with the engine in a stand. The first of these deals with the removal and replacement of the timing belt, a job that has to be done as part of routine service every 60,000 miles. The first step is to remove the top timing belt cover, which is held in place by two bolts. In addition, the cam cover has to be removed. At this point, you set the engine to top dead centre, watching not only the marking on the crankshaft pulley, but the two cutouts in the end of the cams. These are off centre and must lie parallel to and above the level of the top cylinder head face. Of the two pulley markings, the second must line up with the moulding on the sump. The new camshaft alignment tool should now be inserted in the cutouts at the end of the camshafts to lock them in position. And if it doesn't fit immediately, it's quite legitimate to ease one of the camshafts to make the tool fit. Once this is done, you'll need to block the flywheel and remove the crankshaft pulley retaining bolt so you can pull off the pulley. The water pump pulley, which is held in place by four bolts, must also come off. You can now unbolt the two lower front covers, which lets you reach the timing belt. To remove the belt, all you need to do is release the tensioner and the belt can be eased off the camshaft sprockets and the crankshaft sprocket. When you come to fit a new timing belt, you must first relocate the crankshaft pulley. You reset piston number one to top dead centre, aligning the second pulley marking with the moulding on the sump. Because in production, belt tension is set by using special tools and gauges, another means of establishing the correct tension is needed in service. And this is done by means of a special service spring, which you'll have to fit. Also provided with the service spring is an anchor bolt onto which the spring can locate. Once this bolt is in position, the tensioner should be removed. The spring can be attached to the tensioner in the prescribed hole and the other end of the spring hooked onto the anchor bolt. the tensioner should then be replaced. And it should be held against the service spring with an Allen key while the retaining belt is tightened. This will give you enough clearance to fit the new belt. There's nothing difficult about fitting the belt, providing you start at the crankshaft sprocket and work upwards. Make sure that the belt locates properly on the sprocket and then, running it first past the belt guide pulley, position it counterclockwise over the camshaft sprockets. 
It's important while you're doing this to keep the belt under tension all the time, so it locates without any slack. The tensioner should then be released to hold the belt taut. At this stage, the camshaft alignment tool should be removed from the end of the camshafts so you can check the alignment of the camshaft and crank. You do this by turning the engine over twice and realigning the second marking on the crankshaft pulley. Then check to see if the camshaft alignment tool can be fitted back in the cutouts in the end of the camshafts. If it fits one but not the other, you should loosen the sprocket bolt for the camshaft the tool won't fit. Then ease the camshaft to allow the tool to fit. Leave the tool in place and tighten up the camshaft sprocket bolt. You now repeat the process, first removing the alignment tool, then turning the engine over twice and realigning the crankshaft pulley marking. and then checking that the camshaft alignment tool fits the slots in both camshafts. If it does, your timing belt is satisfactorily fitted and you can torque the sprocket bolt. As to the two overhead camshafts, there's nothing unusual in the way they're located there's little apparent difference between the two, except for the fact that the camshaft serving the inlet valves has the camshaft identification lobe at the rear. So that bearing caps are not mixed up, those on the exhaust side are marked 0 to 4, those on the inlet side 5 to 9, and their precise order of fitting is shown in your technician's literature. If you have to remove one or both camshafts, perhaps for work on the valve train or even for removal of the cylinder head, the first step is to take off the timing belt. The sprockets themselves are held in place merely by fastening bolts. Once you remove these bolts, you'll find that there are no locating flats or keyways to engage them with the camshafts. They're simply frictionally engaged. With the belts removed, they simply lift away from the camshafts. Furthermore, both sprockets are identical, so can be replaced on either cam. The camshaft bearing caps are untightened in small steps in a prescribed order which must be followed to avoid damage to the camshafts. Once the front bearing caps are off, the camshaft oil seals can be pulled out. You don't need to remove them with a special tool at an earlier stage. After which, the camshafts themselves can simply be lifted off the engine. For any work on the valve train, there are certain new special tools that should make life easier for you. The valve spring compressor and its adapter are the ones that are common to most current Ford engines. Hydraulic tappets are used, which are not only maintenance free, but provide an absolutely precise relationship between the tappets and the cam lobes. 
Removing the valve collets is no longer the fiddle it used to be. There's a new remover and replacer tool that has a magnetic tip. When pressed down over the top of the valve stem as the spring is being compressed, it picks the collets out. This then enables the spring to be lifted out. As to the valve seat, this is now a seat and seal assembly, and to remove it, there's another new special tool. This screws down over the seal so that you can pull it out. Replacement of valve springs and seals is almost the reverse of their removal. Except in the case of the combined seat and seal, this should merely be placed in position over the valve stem. It doesn't need to be pressed into position. This will be done by the valve spring once it's compressed. To replace the collets, fit them carefully over the magnetic tip of the new special tool. Then compress the valve spring Position the collets by placing the tool over the top of the valve stem. Release the valve spring compressor and remove the tool. A little easier than it used to be. The hydraulic tappet simply seats over the top of the valve spring. Cylinder head removal follows much the same procedure as on other four-cylinder Ford engines. The main point to remember is that as with any aluminium cylinder head, it's an absolute must to untighten the head bolts in a prescribed order and in small steps. You'll find that order fully detailed in your technician's literature. Another point to bear in mind is that the head bolts can be reused twice at most. However, if you're faced with a vehicle for which you do not have an accurate service record, it would be as well to renew them automatically. Once the bolts are out, the head can be lifted clear to reveal the head gasket and the flat-topped pistons. Before refitting the cylinder head, check that piston number one is a top dead centre. You'll find that the block has locating dowels which help position the new gasket and the head itself. Once the head is in position, there's nothing magical about tightening it down. Again, bolts must be tightened in the prescribed order, which is in your literature, and in three stages. The first stage of tightening is at a prescribed torque shown in your literature. The second is at a higher torque, The third stage is to tighten each bolt through 90 to 120 degrees. And for this last stage, you can use the familiar angle gauge if necessary.
When refitting the camshafts, there are one or two points to bear in mind. To begin with, make sure that all the bearing seats are thoroughly lubricated before the camshafts are placed in position. As to the camshafts themselves, remember that the identifying mark is the camshaft identification lobe at the rear of the inlet camshaft. When you place the camshafts in position, make sure that the groove at the rear end of each, which is cut slightly off-center, is positioned above the level of the head but virtually parallel to it. The bearing caps, each of which is numbered, should be fitted in the positions shown in your literature. The two front bearer caps, unlike the others, must have sealing compound applied to the contact area at the front of the cap. Before talking these caps down, it's worth making sure you really know the order of tightening because, as with the cylinder head, it's quite possible to damage the camshafts if you follow the wrong order. The camshaft oil seals are fitted using an existing special tool. The point to bear in mind is that they should not be lubricated before they're fitted. If they're fitted correctly, they should be flush with the front face of each bearing cap. Refitting the timing belt after a major dismantling operation is done in exactly the same way as you would fit a new belt. The camshaft alignment tool must first be located in the groove at the rear of each camshaft, and this locks the camshafts in the correct position relative to the crankshaft. The cam sprockets can now be fitted, although at this stage they should be left finger tight. If you're working on an engine that is not fitted with a tensioning spring at the belt tensioner, you'll have to fit the special service spring at this stage. Once again, this involves fitting the anchor bolt, then positioning the service spring so it's hooked onto the tensioner and over the bolt. And finally, refitting the tensioner before temporarily setting it back against the tension of the spring. At this point, you must fit the crankshaft pulley to set piston number one to top dead center. The belt itself must be fitted from the bottom up, working anti-clockwise, and making sure all the time that you hold it under tension. The tensioner can then be released to tension the belt. At this point, you should tighten the cam sprocket bolts. You then remove the camshaft alignment tool, turn the engine over twice and reset it to top dead center using the pulley marking, and replace the camshaft alignment tool. If it doesn't fit, loosen the sprocket on the cam it won't fit.
ease the camshaft so the tool will fit. And then re-torque the sprocket. You then repeat the process by removing the tool, turning the engine over twice more and resetting to top dead center, and finally checking to make sure the camshaft alignment tool does now fit. And if it does, the adjustment is correct and you can torque the sprocket bolts to specification. The cam cover is fitted with a form of rubber gasket and whenever the cover is removed, the gasket should be renewed. It locates neatly in the grooves of the casting and each of the cover bolts fits through the gasket. So the bolts don't trap and damage the gasket, Spacer bushings locate in the cam cover through which the bolts pass. Each spacer is fitted with an O-ring for oil tightness and these need to be renewed when the cover is replaced. The only other point to remember is to tighten down the securing bolts evenly. The heart of the lubrication system in the engine is a G-rotor type oil pump. The pump is very similar to those currently fitted to Ford CVH engines and it locates at the front of this engine and is driven directly by the crankshaft. In the sump there's a large baffle plate to combat oil surge and splash. The oil pickup tube extends deep into the sump for a reliable oil feed. On the 130 PS version of this engine, oil spray pipes direct oil onto the undersides of the pistons for additional cooling. While the oil feed through most of the rest of the engine is as might be expected, the feed to the hydraulic tappets and the camshaft bearings is via two galleries linked by a cross channel. A key feature is the drain back siphon valve that prevents oil drain back after the engine is switched off. As with the cam cover, the sump gasket is a rubber type that seats in the grooves in the casting. It must be renewed whenever the sump is removed. When you refit the sump, there are four joints on the block sealing surface that must have sealer applied to them. Because the sump contributes to the structural rigidity of the engine as a whole, it's particularly important that you carefully check its alignment. The sump bolts can then be tightened down to specification. As part of the emission controls, there's a crankcase ventilation system that feeds oil fumes into the air intake system so that they're burnt rather than released as hydrocarbons into the atmosphere. It also prevents the formation of black sludge in the engine. The crankshaft position sensor is set into the rear face of the block. It reads a circle of holes precisely drilled into the inner face of the flywheel. And as with all such sensors, its position can't be adjusted. Both front and rear crankshaft oil seals are removed and replaced with available special tools 
The rear seal sits in a retainer housing bolted to the block. The engine's coolant is driven round the cooling system by a front-mounted water pump that picks up its drive via a poly V-belt from the crankshaft. The thermostat housing is located at the rear of the engine. It houses both the temperature gauge sender unit and the ECT sensor. A point to bear in mind, should you have to refit the exhaust manifold, it's important to place a special guide bush on the rearmost locating stud after you've fitted the gasket and before fitting the manifold. If you don't, it'll be impossible to achieve an accurate alignment. A notable feature on this manifolding is the familiar pulse air system that is just part of the comprehensive emission control system. And should you need to dismantle the air and fuel inlet system, there's nothing complicated. There's first of all the heat shield flange with its gasket. This is followed by the forged aluminium flange that incorporates the fuel rail and injectors. Each injector is retained by two bolts and can be easily removed in service. There's a gasket that sits on the outside of the flange and then the air inlet manifold bolts over the flange, the studs running through it and the flange to locate in the head. And in part three of this programme, we'll take a closer look at this system, along with key engine management features. In the early 80s, Ford progressively introduced electronic engine management systems on most of its models. Since then, consistent development has turned this EEC-4 system into one of the most advanced management systems in use today. To understand where EEC-4 stands today, it's worth briefly tracing its development from the time it was first introduced. Essentially, a mini-computer that both monitored and controlled key systems in the engine and car EEC-4 began life by sensing four of the most important engine functions. A vane air meter measured the volume of air flowing into the engine and the air temperature and sent this information to EEC-4. A coolant temperature sensor also relayed its information to the module. A throttle position sensor kept watch on the throttle plate so that the module always knew its exact position. And in the distributor, a Hall effect sensor told the module the precise position and speed of the crankshaft. This information was read and processed by EEC-4 and it sent out a continual stream of instructions to various activators. One was a voltage signal to the fuel injector valves that simultaneously opened them all for a calculated period of time, so releasing a precisely metered amount of fuel. Another was a spark-out signal to the TFI module that switched the coil primary circuit and triggered the ignition pulse to the plugs. A voltage signal was sent to the idle speed control valve to regulate engine idle speed. A fourth signal was the self-test output signal that gave you a readout of defect codes on an LED tester. This range of monitoring and control functions made a marked improvement in the control of key engine functions. But more was to come, primarily through the introduction of a regulated catalytic converter. A HEGO sensor was added to monitor the level of residual oxygen in the exhaust gases. EEC-4 needed this to control the air-fuel ratio. A manifold absolute pressure sensor, which eventually replaced the vane air meter, was used to sense inlet manifold vacuum. 
This helped Eek4 adjust the fuel feed and spark advance according to engine load. An air charge temperature sensor advised the module on inlet air temperature once the vane air meter had been replaced. A vehicle speed sensor told the module how fast the vehicle was travelling. And a knock sensor on some engines told the module about engine detonations where low octane fuel was being used so that ignition timing could be retarded. This substantially increased range of information was used by EEC4 to control the EGR valve that released exhaust gas into the inlet system on some engines. It controlled the pulse air system which generates secondary combustion to both speed up the heating of the catalyst and reduce hydrocarbon content in the exhaust gases. An evaporative emission control system was introduced to absorb fuel fumes from the fuel tank ventilation. It included a solenoid-type purge valve controlled by EEC4. And with the increased power of the module, a newly developed two-digit star tester could now be used in the workshop, giving a wider range of defect codes. By the late 80s, EEC4 was taking another stride forward, this time in relation to smaller engines. Central fuel injection was introduced and placed under the control of the engine management system. At the same time, banked fuel injection was introduced on V6 engines and more recently on the 2-litre DOHC unit. This was placed under the control of EEC4. And on V6 engines, a second HEGO sensor was added to provide monitoring of exhaust gases from both banks of cylinders. Then came the Distributorless Electronic Ignition System, EDIS-4. The result of this development was that the Hall Effect Distributor, the Ignition Coil and the TFI module were thrown away, being replaced by a crank position sensor to feed information to EEC-4. It was accompanied by a dual spark ignition coil and the EDIS-4 ignition module, both of which fell under the control of EEC-4. The crank position and speed sensor took over the role of the Hall Effect sensor. A variation to this arrangement was the high tension distributor introduced on the 2-litre 8-valve DOHC unit. It was used in combination with an HT coil and TFI module, and here ignition advance was controlled solely by EEC4. This immensely wide range of monitoring and control functions has now been applied to the new 16-valve DOHC engine range. EEC4 has been given an even bigger 56K memory, and one or two key features have been added. To date, only available on the 24-valve 2.9-litre V6 unit, the new range of engines has been given the advanced mass airflow metering system. In effect, air is drawn in through a replaceable air filter, and it channels down the inlet pipe. Above the inlet pipe is a bypass channel. Inside, a hot wire sensor programmed to remain at 200 degrees centigrade above the temperature of incoming air. According to air flow, the current needed to sustain this temperature rises or falls, and EEC4 uses this current variation to calculate the mass of incoming air. Another function, strictly under the control of EEC4 on these new engines, is the fuel injection system. This is a sequential system. That means to say that fuel injection is precisely timed by EEC4 to deliver exactly the right amount of fuel at exactly the right time to each individual injector, irrespective of what the engine is doing. 
A completely new engine monitoring device is the camshaft identification sensor. Located at the rear of the inlet camshaft, this tells EEC4 the precise position of piston number one during its four-stroke cycle. The module uses this information to time fuel injection to each cylinder. The EDIS-4 ignition system is now integrated with the EEC4 self-test program. It sends a diagnostic monitor signal to the main module that enables checks to be made on, for example, the primary and secondary circuits, and all the input and output signals fed to and from the EDIS module. Any faults are recorded by the EEC4 module and stored in its self-test memory. As part of the new engine's emission control systems, there's a completely revised and highly efficient pulse air system under EEC4's control. This provides for secondary combustion of exhaust gases and in so doing helps to remove hydrocarbons from those gases. Introduced recently on the RS2000 and therefore still fairly new as an EEC4 related system is the power steering pressure switch now to be a standard feature on all vehicles with this new engine range where power steering is specified. A final and most important development for you in service is that EEC4 now provides an enormous self-test capability. Over a hundred codes covering virtually every conceivable fault that may occur within the overall management system. To access these codes, you now need to use the new three-digit star tester that is used in much the same way as the previous two-digit version. You'll find that revisions to your vehicle systems test manual fully cover all the codes and conditions you might encounter with clear procedural instructions for rectifying any fault that may be found. So, in summary, a remarkable new engine range that brings state-of-the-art multi-valve technology within the reach of all Ford's customers and provides you, the service technician, with a unit that is a real pleasure to service and maintain.